coming up on The World Today. A code red for humanity, that's how the UN describes its just-released landmark climate study. It's full of warnings of extreme heat waves, droughts and flooding. Climate change expert Dr. John Osoma joins us to break down the report and explains the role humans can play to help save the planet. Plus, the euphoria of the Olympics gone. A warm welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Adegoke in Lagos. We begin with the scary reports from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change painting a worsening climate in the near future. With warnings of extreme heat waves, droughts and flooding, and a key temperature limit being broken in just over a decade, scientists say it is a catastrophe, a catastrophe the world can avoid if it acts fast. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has added his voice saying if we combine forces now, we can avert climate catastrophe. But that the report makes it clear that there is no time for delay and no room for excuses. Just a few highlights of the report. It says global surface temperature was 1.09 degrees Celsius higher in the decade between 2011 to 2020 than between 1850 and 1900. It says recent rates of sea level rise has nearly tripled compared with 1901 to 1971. It also says human influence is very likely, is the very likely main driver of the global retreat of glaciers since the 1990s and the decrease in Arctic sea rise and more. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and making extreme weather events more frequent and severe. Second, it shows that climate change is affecting every region on our planet. And lastly, it explains that strong, rapid, sustained reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions would be required to limit global warming. Atmosphere has been exposed to doping, which means that we have begun observing climate extremes more often than before. That means record-breaking temperatures, uh, drought, uh, forest fires uh, observed also this year and also during these days uh, increase in California, for example. We have also more water vapor into atmosphere, which has led to severe flooding problems as observed in Central Europe and China recently with, uh, with several casualties, unfortunately. No one yes. According to this report, we are, we are still having a chance to stop the negative climate trend uh, during the mid uh, of this century by especially limiting the use of fossil fuels and by stopping deforestation. Some changes will continue for centuries and, or even thousands of years, like sea level rise, uh, melting of glaciers and shrinking of Arctic uh, sea ice and snow cover. Executive Director at Greenpeace UK, John Salvin, says the world needs to take note of the recent UN report and act immediately to prevent catastrophic climate change. He says government's failure to take strong enough steps to combat climate change was akin to pressing snooze on an alarm. You know, it's a bit like an alarm clock. You can keep switching the alarm clock off, but eventually, if you don't get out of bed and go to wherever you're meant to be going to, it will be too late. You won't get there in time. And I think that this is what this report really is saying. Listen, the alarm clock has gone off many times. This is probably the last report that will be written before we go through and beyond 1.5 degree C, unless we act now. And that's quite a stark warning. These reports are very weighty. Nobody's going to read them. But you can just read the headlines. You know, the wildfires out of control in Greece and Turkey, the heat domes in California and, and, and you know, uh, British Columbia and Canada, the wildfires out of control in Siberia, the floods in Germany and in China. You just look anywhere around the world and you see climate catastrophe unfolding. All this report is doing really is putting the science behind this, saying that we are now certain this is human-induced. 
Joining us now is climate change expert Dr. John Osonwa. He joins us from our studios in Abuja. Dr. Osonwa, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Now, this report paints a bleak, very bleak future for our Earth. Could you explain very simply what's going on, what's going to happen in the very near future if countries do not reduce greenhouse emissions? Well, uh, we're already seeing the impact of climate change. I I'm going to focus on Africa because we've heard so much about America and Europe. Here in Africa, desertification is encroaching uh, at a very rapid pace. In Nigeria here, desertification is coming in at about 3.5 kilometers per year. It is devastating the frontline states. We have drought uh, all over Africa starvation, hunger, uh, we have forced migration, we have climate refugeeism, people forced to flee uh, their traditional homelands in search of greener pastures, uh, and is leading to conflicts and other things. So climate change has a palpable impact on our lives and our livelihoods. Uh, so we need to take this report seriously. You know, the last report uh, was in 2013. At that time, there was still there was still some doubt, uh, some equivocation on the issue of whether uh, human beings are causing climate change. Now, this report makes it unequivocal. We are the primary cause of climate change, global warming, and some of these extreme weather events that we're seeing. So uh, there's a lot that we need to be mindful of. You have sea level rise. Uh, you have ocean surges. You have intensifying hurricanes. Uh, that are coming in earlier in the tropical season, uh, that are more devastating, uh, and are even uh, affecting us here in Africa. We call them cyclones here, but they're essentially hurricanes. Oh, well, just like you've said, some experts are also pointing, accusing fingers at humans, and we've always looked to governments to take action, but the real work is with industries and companies. How can you know, government intervention ensure these people and we as humans actually take responsible, responsibility? Uh, the first thing is what governments can do at a macro level. You know, we have the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, since then, governments are supposed to come up with ambitious plans, uh, carbon emission plans that they will submit and try to live up to. So that is the first step. We need to have more aggressive plans. These are macro plans that cut across many sectors in the economy. Then the next thing is enforcement, is, is aggressive and sincere enforcement of our climate uh, regulations and rules and laws. Uh, most of the time, you see lax enforcement. We also need to uh, amplify our use of the polluter pays principle, uh, which we use in environmental protection, whereby you track uh, the, the, the chain uh, of pollution and hold all the actors accountable. Government also needs to incentivize and catalyze action towards the switch to uh, carbon neutrality, uh, meaning that we want to bring in cleaner energy uh, sources. We want to bring in solar energy, uh, wind energy, uh, micro, hydro, uh, biofuels. These things are very helpful for us uh, in the environment. Right now, the global uh, funding for renewables as of 2018 is only about $288 uh, billion. Uh, whereas the one for traditional energy, oil, gas, coal, is still almost a billion dollars. So we need to improve the funding mechanisms, the incentive mechanisms, and the enforcement mechanisms uh, by government. Well, that now that is for the government. It comes down to you and me. How can we save our planet? Well, uh, the other uh, wonderful thing that is happening is uh, companies are banding together to take action, even government action even where government action uh, is not very aggressive. For instance, you have companies coming now to make his, uh, a, a, a neutrality pledge, zero neutrality, we call it, uh, zero emission by 2030. 
uh, Microsoft, for instance, has already gone ahead to say we are not only going to achieve uh, carbon neutrality, we are going to achieve carbon negativity, meaning they are going to uh, capture more carbon than they emit. They are going to remove more carbon from the atmosphere. So those are good things. Here, uh, uh, for practical purposes, we need to checkmate deforestation. Uh, trees are very useful for the environment. They sequester carbon. They keep the environment cool. Uh, we need to look at how we are using our resources. In most cases, we are not using our resources sustainably. Uh, and that is leading to biodiversity loss. That is leading to rapid loss of our ecosystems. So these are some of the things that we can do. People should take stock of their carbon emissions, see how you can improve on what you're doing. Uh, people should look at uh, cleaner energy sources uh, for electricity, for industrial production. Uh, these things are, are good steps uh, that we need to take right now because we are facing an existential threat. All right, then. Thank you so much, Dr. John Osonwa, climate change expert. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you. Our change in climate is perhaps more evident now in the raging wildfires in Greece where firefighters on the island of Evia are tackling the country's numerous blazes. Greek authorities have today begun assessing the damage from wildfires that have devastated huge swaths of forests and forced thousands to flee from their homes over the past week as fires burned unabated in many parts of the country. The biggest front was on the island of Evia, east of the capital, which has so far forced the evacuation of dozens of villages and thousands of people, while flames engulfed forests and homes in the island's north. Prime Minister Krikos Mitsotakis is scheduled to chair a ministerial meeting today on relief measures for those who lost property in the fires. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Nigerian ambassador to Greece, Nimi Akikube, says the mission is gathering information from authorities and leaders of the Nigerian community in Greece to see how and if Nigerians might have been affected in the fires. According to her, there are currently no reported fatalities amongst members of the Nigerian community, but she expressed her concern for Greek citizens and other communities who have been affected by the fires and would continue to proffer whatever assistance within Nigeria's limited capacity to the host country. But we're going to have more details from the fires in Greece also. Japan remembers the fall-in from the atomic bomb in Nagasaki. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. We continue with one of our leading stories, the wildfires in Greece, as firefighters on the island of Evia are tackling the country's numerous blazes. We have the VOA's Anthe Karasava joining us from Athens. Anthe, thank you so much for joining us. A dire situation exists right now in Greece with the fires. How badly are they raging? Absolutely. It's day seven in this destructive course of this in, in, inferno. Um, and uh, obviously there are scores and dozens of, and scores of fires still active across the country from its northern tip to south. And even those, in fact, that have been placed under some kind of check are still a major threat and risk because of potential flare-ups um, and, and these flames kind of leaping back into life, something that we've seen repeatedly throughout this past week. Obviously, the most destructive um, uh, front is what we're seeing on the island of Evia and on its northern tip. Uh, Evia is Greece's second biggest island. Uh, just in that 
part of Greece alone. We've seen hundreds of thousands of acres being raised to the ground. Um, and the hope was that today, because gale force, force winds were kind of um, subsiding and international aid was coming in and deployment of firefighters from uh, all sorts of countries, that they could at least bring this fire or in its various fronts um, into check. Uh, there's still about an hour until nightfall for these, uh, before these water dropping planes make their last uh, rescue attempt. Um, but it seems unlikely that even today, in these improving conditions, uh, that these uh, that these fronts can be and and flames and and fires can be brought into check. Mm. Well, I understand you have had to evacuate. Describe for us what that has been like for you and your situation now. Well, it's been very difficult in the sense that you, you know. Uh, Simply as, as, as a Western citizen, um, you, you know, you just don't expect these types of scenarios to be unfolding in a Western capital. Uh, you know, you hear, we were hearing all of these, uh, you, you, you know, fires kind of raging on the outskirts of Athens where I, my home is situated. But you never kind of thought, and I never thought that it would come to such um, a close distance to my home. And I felt I was in denial for quite a long time. But when I saw actually the smoke uh, kind of billowing and notices coming in that the district just north of me was being evacuated, uh, then I got really, really concerned. And, and, and you face a very difficult dilemma. You know, most of these times when, I, and when I'm out reporting and even on this particular story, you kind of see these people who are refusing to leave and you're like, you know, how can you not be fleeing for your life? But I faced a similar dilemma when I was basically came back and found myself trying to pack up my life within 10 minutes. And you're like, what do I actually pack? And, and what is important and what is not important uh, for me within 10 minutes to pack in a suitcase, a, an overnight suitcase. And, I've, I, and, and I have to be honest, uh, you know, I never got that evacuation order per se to leave my home because gusts of wind managed to steer uh, this flame to, to the east um, and to the sea. But, I, you know, I can't be honest in telling you that if I faced an evacuation order, I don't know what I would have done in the end, whether I would have stayed uh, like many of my compatriots uh, fighting for their homes, their memories or left like others. Um, several thousands have done so. Well, it's quite the ordeal and I can only imagine what you all are going through. But, you know, you mentioned earlier that international aid was coming. Tell us what help is on the ground, who has responded and what have they done? Well, there's a, I mean, from the first, from the first, uh, from the start of this crisis, um, uh, the government really reached out internationally, primarily to the European Union, of which it is a member, um, and called for urgent assistance. And there were very, many, many countries that have um, kind of signed up and are already deployed here from France, Sweden. Uh, we are, are now understanding that a massive water dropping plane, excuse me, two massive water dropping planes are coming in from Russia, Serbians, uh, uh, rangers and firefighters are also deployed mainly now along and on Evia, which is the most destructive uh, front, supporting at least 500 Greek firefighters and hundreds more volunteers who, uh, who are there. All right, then. Thank you so much, Anthe Karasava, the VOA's correspondent in Athens. Please stay safe. Thank you. Well, there seems to be better delivery of service to Nigerians seeking international passports in the United Kingdom. As at today, over 24,000 Nigerian passports have been processed by the Nigerian High Commission in the UK. This information came to the fore during the visit of Chairman of Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, NITCOM, Honorable Abike Dabiri Erewa, to the Nigerian High Commission to the United Kingdom. 
Ambassador Tunji Sarafa Ishola. Before now, Nigerians living in the United Kingdom waited endlessly for their international passports to be delivered after application, and for months, nothing came through. But there is a turnaround in the situation, presently with over 24,000 passports ready for collection, and this feat was achieved in just three months. The High Commissioner believes there's still room for improvement as he welcomes Chairman of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission to his UK office. Well, I want my tenure to be defined through strengthening the bilateral relations between Nigeria and UK. Not how many Nigerians get passports here uh, easily. And uh, that's why we went in and I must commend the entire mission for standing up to make sure that we, we were able to eradicate corruption in the process. We are able to put the process on auto drive and uh, we also see the opportunity to, to appreciate the Nigerian Immigration Office, uh, I mean, service uh, standing up and to be counted by ensuring the regular supply of book booklets because booklet is not an issue in the uh, London mission as of today. And we, we believe that it will not uh, be so again. Um, we, we, uh, we have actually enrolled 24,630. Uh, applicants mm -hmm. in this process. Uh, uh, we had uh, 18,000 backlog at uh, 16th of April when the process started. And uh, today, we're happy to say that uh, 23,654 uh, passport booklets have been issued. To mm -hmm. the those seeking new passports are expected to apply six months before expiration of their document. The new passport will be valid for a 10-year period. The NITCOM chairman takes advantage of the meeting to present a copy of the recently ratified and adopted national diaspora policy to the High Commissioner. Even as they both advise the diaspora groups in the UK to work in unity with the authorities to fast-track developments back home as well as strengthen bilateral relations between Nigeria and the United Kingdom. Around 500 participants, including Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga, today gathered at Nagasaki Peace Park to commemorate the 76th anniversary of the U.S. atomic bombing. Participants wore masks and maintained social distancing at the downscaled event that was held amid the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. At 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, a bomb nicknamed Little Boy was dropped by the U.S. B-29 warplane Enola Gay and obliterated the city of Hiroshima. Three days after the Hiroshima attack, on August 9, 1945, the United States dropped another atomic bomb on Nagasaki, southern Japan. The city estimates that around 210 people were killed by the attacks, leaving more than 150,000 others injured. And that's all we have for you on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoki.